Bismillah, alhamdulillah, you're watching Way of the Muslim, defining the Muslim's character. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and for the next few minutes, we'd like to talk on the subject of what Muslims should do when they find themselves in predicaments or situations that are coming up today, things that we hear people say and do, and how should we as Muslims respond. We're going to be referring to the teachings of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, referred to as hadiths or narrations, and then what he says will translate more or less to the English language, keeping it in simple terms, and hopefully it will help us in understanding and developing our Muslim character. The first uh, hadith I'd like to mention is one where a man is actually accusing another person of going to go to hell. He says, by Allah, this man is swearing, and the Prophet is telling this story, he says, by Allah I swear that Allah is not going to forgive this person, so and so. Whereas Allah the Most High says, Who is it that swears by me that I'm not going to forgive so and so? I have forgiven so and so, and have rendered your actions in vain. Well, now immediately this tells us that we should be very careful that when we start to speak about anything, especially when we swear, swear by Allah, that what we're saying is accurate, it's true. And we shouldn't assume the worst about Allah. We should assume the best about Allah. One of the things about Allah is His, His nature of what we call Rahma, or His graciousness, His mercy. Allah's mercy prevails over all things. There's very, very little that Allah is going to not forgive. As a matter of fact, He tells you in the Quran what it is. It's shirk and everything that goes along with it. Allah said more or less in the Quran that he does not forgive shirk, but anything less than this he can forgive. So when a person observes other people out here doing X and Y and Z, if it's not shirk, then they better be careful by saying that Allah is not going to forgive them. Of course, this brings us to another question here. What is shirk? And that is to associate partners with Allah in worship. This is something real important in Islam. There is no God beside Allah. And we can't make any images or idols or anything to worship as partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty. And so when this person is stating, I swear Allah is not going to give this, forgive this person, by what authority is he saying these things? Because in fact Allah forgives him, but he doesn't forgive this man. Now, suppose a man is really good and he goes through the whole life doing good deeds and he's calling others to do good deeds. He finds somebody who doesn't listen to him, who doesn't do these good deeds he wants him to do. He said, oh, you keep doing this evil, you're doing these bad things, so I swear by Allah, you're going to go to hell for that. So on the day of judgment, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got the right, and he will ask him, who is the person saying that I can't forgive somebody? Because in fact, it is Allah who forgives and forgives and forgives. And it's not up to me to say this. Because, in fact, that means that if a person says this, he's associating himself with Allah by saying, Allah will do this or won't do that, and who are we to say what Allah will do and not do? This is very important. We could go more on that subject, but we've got another topic coming up here, and I wanted to deal with this too, because it's another situation that we see very regularly these days. And uh, it was said that the Prophet ﷺ stood amongst his companions to deliver his speech. And from his speech was that he said, Indeed, it is about to occur that I will be called and I will respond. What this means is that the Prophet is saying that it's about to happen that I'm going to die. He'll be called to, uh, to Allah and that he will respond to that. He says, Then after me there will be rulers over you who say what they have knowledge of, and they act upon what they know. Obedience to them is obedience to me. And you remain like that for a time. But then there will be rulers over you, after these people, who will say what they do not have knowledge of. So whoever is sincere to them, or assists them, or strengthens them, then they are destroyed and they have caused destruction. He continues by giving us an order in here. Accompany them with your bodies and differ with them 
by your actions and bear witness for the doer of good from them that he's a good deed doer <laughs> and for the one who does evil that in fact he is a doer of evil. For a better understanding of this, we should realize the Quran has taught us a very valuable lesson. And the Prophet ﷺ is explaining this lesson in details. Allah tells us in the Quran, for the believers, you have to obey Allah. Ati Allah. Wa ati Rasul. Which means that we also have to obey His Messenger. One of the verses in the Quran clearly states, obey the Messenger. So that you understand obedience to the Messenger is, in fact, obedience to Allah. Now, there's a famous hadith which is misquoted very often by folks today when they come up to each other and they say, Adin and Nasiha, that our way of Islam is advice. So, brother, I have to advise you. And they will begin by telling you your beard is too short or that your pants are too long or that your prayers are not acceptable, etc., etc. They're giving you what they're saying is Nasiha. But in this hadith, what we're finding out from this, that, in fact, this is not correct, because they didn't read the whole hadith. Because the people asked the Prophet ﷺ, when they said, Adina Nasiha, they said, to who? He said, to Allah, and to his messenger, and to those in authority over you, and then to the general public. Now, I want to ask you a question, I want you to think about it. How do you give, if you translate the word Nasiha as advice, how do you give advice to Allah? What will you advise Allah in? Audhu Billah. This doesn't make any sense. And how will you advise the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he is the one to bring the message to us? We don't have any right to speak to him on that. And then, what about the rulers? In most cases, you or I don't have access to those who are in authority over us. And then certainly, if you said, for all the people in general, I can only give advice to my own immediate family and the people I know, except through programs like this. But still, what does this word mean, Nasiha? It's better understood by going to the scholars of the Arabic language and asking them, which is what I did. And they said, actually, this is talking about a form of very deep sincerity. Very deep sincerity. Being loyal and obedient and in doing it in sincerity. To be sincere and loyal to Allah and the same to His Messenger, to those in authority over you and to the general public. And this can be done by anybody and it makes sense. Now I want to come back and look at this hadith again because we're learning here that the Prophet is saying that I'm soon to die. He's telling his companions he's preparing for his death, which is imminent for all of us. It's going to happen. But now here he's saying that, in specifically, there are going to be people after me who have knowledge. And they're going to be rulers over you. And when you follow them, because they're acting on this knowledge that they have of Islam, then you're the, doing the same as if you were following me. Obedience to these people is the same as if you were obeying me. He says, then there are going to be others after that, though. After a period of time, you're going to find others who are going to come, be rulers over you. But they're not having the right knowledge. And they're acting on this lack of knowledge. And what's happening now is, if you obey them, if you assist them, and you strengthen them in what they're doing, then you're destroying yourself, and you're bringing about a form of destruction. But he does give us an order, and I want us to pay attention because it's not right to read part of a hadith and then leave off the rest of it. He tells you what to do in this case. You accompany them with your body. Stay with them physically. And then you differ with them by your actions, showing the good way. By the character. That's what this program is about. For us to develop that good Muslim character. By understanding the Prophet ﷺ, what he wants us to do. He wants us in these times when we have these kind of problems to show the best possible character of the Muslim. Differ with them by your actions and bear witness of those that do good, that that's good. And then of those that are doing evil, show that to be evil by saying this is wrong. So what we're supposed to do is speak out in this case against these actions.
Now, I realize that some of the brothers will refer to another hadith which says that if you see an evil, when you see something that's really horrible, then you have to do what? You have to change it by your hand if you can. Or change it by your tongue if you can't do the other. And if you can't change it by your tongue, then at least you have to hate it with all your heart. And this is the lower or the least amount of faith. But this also has to be understood in conjunction with other hadiths, which we've just read. It's not permissible for any of us, especially non-scholars, to go out here and pick up a couple of hadiths or teaching of Muhammad and then try to invent the whole religion around that. Our scholars, and we pray for them all the time, regardless of their mistakes, are still the ones that are qualified. They're the ones that we should be turning to, to get this information. To understand that there's a whole lot more here than one or two of these. And certainly when you read the rest of what we're going to be talking about in this program, you're going to realize that, in fact, this is correct. That we have to balance that. When do I change something by my hand? And what does that mean, change it by my hand? And he told you right here, if you're accompanying them, then differ with them by your actions. Your actions... This is what you do. You show the right way. Then bear witness of those that do good. That's using your tongue. And say, this is good. And those that are doing evil say, no, this is evil. And that's it. That makes sense? Let's proceed forward. There's another hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said that the shaitan, the devil, has given up on those people who pray that they should worship him from the Arabian Peninsula. But, he seeks to provoke animosity between them. It's very obvious from this that the true worshippers of Allah, that the devil has given up trying to get them to worship him instead of Allah. But he's still going to try his best to make them have infighting and have this animosity. And this is exactly what we have seen over the years where the Muslims begin to fight amongst themselves and this is inspired by none other than the devil himself. So we, again, in developing our Muslim character, should learn how to work together. Even though some of the things are difficult, we go back to the first hadith we mentioned, and that's talking about what to do when you have rulers over you who are not having the right knowledge or acting on the right knowledge, but still, if they do good, verify that it's good from it. When they do evil, then mention that the same way and be fair in our dealings. And we're going to come back for more of this in a few minutes. We're going to take a break. Stay right there. And we'll be back with more of Way of the Muslim, Defining the Muslim Character. Bismillah, we're back. You're watching Way of the Muslim, Defining the Muslim's Character. We've been talking on some of the issues that face us every day and the advice given to us on how to deal with these problems by our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 1400 years ago. Some of the hadith that we discussed dealt with the issues of those who would be rulers over us not having the knowledge of Islam, acting according to what they had, which would be against the right teachings. And then what should be our response? What we gained in knowledge from these hadith, or teachings of Muhammad Sallallahu is that we have to be steadfast, very much so, in doing what? In giving allegiance and obedience to those who are in authority, in as much as they are doing what is right, but avoiding doing what they would order you to do, which is wrong. And this makes sense, because the Quran teaches this, even in specific cases, not to mention the general case. If you look to Surah Al-Luqman, for instance, chapter 31, when in the Quran, when you find that... Uh, the man who is having this wisdom from Allah and treating his son and he's telling his son how to behave. And this is good advice because it says in here, you obey your parents except what? Except in the areas where they would have you worship other than Allah. To worship something you have no knowledge of. And that's the meaning here. It, it, you obey, but to what extent? I want to make real clear on this because after coming into Islam I observed a lot of things the actions difficulties and the brotherhood as well of the Muslims but I noticed that there is this problem that when there's some authority when the emir says something 
immediately there are a few who want to go against that and say something different just because they don't like the emir. Never mind what the statement was. No, they just generalize and say, well, you know, he's not really on the right Islam, so therefore we're not going to even listen to this guy. And this is not correct. This is not the right way. Because we cannot contribute to a society that we abandon. We cannot benefit the people around us by taking what we have, which we assume to be correct, and then abandoning everybody, going away from everybody, leaving everybody, and then we're not helping. Even in the case where Aisha was talking, عنه, was talking about the Prophet Islam, in the one hadith we talked about, where the man came in to wanted to speak to the Prophet. Yet she knew that this was a bad man, and yet how polite was the Prophet وسلم, in dealing with this person. And afterwards she's asking, even though this is a really bad guy, you still gave him this, this dignity, this honor, this respect, the polite treatment. And trying to figure out, you know, you yourself said it wasn't any good, so, but <laughs> you still treat him good. Why? And so it shows that even though somebody is really in the wrong way, the bad way, we do not have the right to just cut them off, walk away from them, if we have something to benefit. If we can benefit them, then we have to try our best to provide this. If they take some good, then that's good. But if they refuse, well, that's their choice. But now there's another fine line here we don't want to cross either. We don't want to join them in what they're doing because the Prophet ﷺ made it clear in the other hadith, whoever strengthens them or supports them and gives credibility to what they're doing, then they're joining them. They're going to destroy themselves and destroy the deen as well. So all of this is leading us up to the conclusion that there's a balance. There's a real nice balance in Islam. When you see evil, of course we have to be against it. The Quran is replete with these types of admonitions to us to call the people to the right way and to forbid what is evil. This statement is repeated a number of times, especially if you read in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 110. This is very close to the meaning when it says that you are the best of people raised up because you call the people to al-maruf and you forbid the munkar. And you believe in Allah. But be careful that you pay close attention to this and this is not the whole ayah. This is not the whole verse. Many people stop with that. But here first we need to define this meaning of maruf and munkar. Maruf in this case is anything good that calls to Allah, that brings us closer to La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And evil is something which would take people away from that in this verse. The reason we say that is because the scholars have told us that in this case Maruf and Munkar is dealing with something specific because the, the juxtaposition of the wording, when you see then it says, What took me nun billah? coming after these two actions. When we asked the scholars about that, they said, this is specific for this ayah, because it means if you're not willing to call the people to what is right and righteous, and you're not willing to forbid those things which were evil and hated by Allah, then how can you say, I believe in Allah? But now let us continue with that ayah and look a little bit closer to that. Because it continues and it says, And if the people of the book had believed, it would have been better for them. Verily, from them are believers, but you'll find most of them are fasikun, those who are disobedient to Allah. I want to specifically mention that because I hear so many times today people saying that, you know, from the... Akhul Kitab, the people of the book, are not the same today as they were back then. These are all kuffar and they are so and so infidels. This is not true. That is not the meaning. That is not what's in the Quran. And I think really and truly if we take time to think about this and look at it, we'll realize that to stay in balance with what the Islam is teaching is clear. Whoever believes in Allah that he is one without partners and they're trying their best to worship him and obey him acting on what they know. Now, specifically, we've been talking about that in this program. Acting upon what they know to the best of their ability. It's up to Allah to be their judge. And it's not up to me or to you or anybody else to say that Allah is never going to forgive this person. We learned that from the first hadith we started with.
And now let's take this one and see what we come up with. This is, by the way, on the authority of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and he said, How will you be when you are covered by a trial in which the young grow up and the old become infirm, and if anything of it is abandoned, it's said, the sunnah has been abandoned. And it was said, when is this going to occur? And they're asking him. He says, it's going to be when your scholars pass away, and the ignorant amongst you become many, when those who recite amongst you are many, but those who have understanding of the religion are few, when your leaders are many, but those who are trustworthy are few, when this world is sought with actions of the hereafter, and when knowledge is sought for other than the religion. The whole, uh, this is not a hadith, by the way, this is a saying of one of the most trusted companions of Muhammad Wasallam. It's a teaching of one of the great teachers of Islam, who of course memorized the entire Quran and relates to us many of the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam. But he's telling us this, not of his own volition. He's telling you very clear, these are prophecies. And we find these mentioned in other books as well, but it's summed here very well. He's asking, what are you going to do during the time of this great fitna when it comes? And they're saying, oh, what, what, are we, what fitna are we talking about here? And he says, it's going to occur when the scholars pass away. And that's strange because, you know, really in recent years I've seen some of the top scholars of Islam, wonderful teachers of Islam, the people who I look up to myself and they're dying. Several died all in the same year in 1999. But in any case, and it says, and the ignorant will be many, and we have so many people today ignorant of Islam. And I'm not talking about the people that are not Muslim. I'm talking about Muslims themselves having so much ignorance, speaking on what they don't know. And look how it continues. It says, and when those who recite, this is talking about the Quran. The people who recite the Quran are going to be many. And we do have that. By the way, we have millions, tens of millions of people living today on this earth, walking and breathing, who have memorized the whole Quran cover to cover. Every single harf, every word, every letter of the Quran, they can recite the whole thing for you. But, and look at what it says, but those who are doing this have very little understanding, except for a few except for a few who really understand what they're reciting. And is that true? Well, I'm not going to mention which countries, because I don't want to make anybody mad at us. But in fact, it's very true, specifically in some of the countries where they insist on memorize the Quran, memorize the Quran, but they don't take the trouble to go to the deep meanings and the beauty of the Quran. And this is something that's actually happened. It says that when your leaders are many, oh, well, there was only one leader of Islam at the time of Muhammad. And in successive rulers, as we heard in some of the other hadiths in this program earlier, there would be those who would be in the right way. It still was only one at a time. But then as the Muslims began to divide up into different uh, continents, different nations, we find different leaders. Until today we have so many Muslim countries with so many different leaders. Again, that's what it says right here. Leaders are many, but those that are trustworthy are few. And when this world is sought with actions of the hereafter, meaning here, now let me clarify that. Well, this is when somebody is going after the hereafter and at the same time using that as a way to finance themselves here. Again, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or say something, uh, just a general statement, but I found myself personally doing the dawah, going out and calling myself and my friends and people to Islam that if I use any type of financial gain out of this thing, then what's going to happen? It destroys it. It takes away the beauty and the barakah of Islam. So it's essential for those people, especially like in my position, to go out strictly for the sake of Allah and not hoping for any kind of material gain whatsoever. Not even mentioning something like this. Much less doing fundraising and all the rest of it for their projects. Because in that could be this thing where a person winds up doing what? They wind up looking for the material wealth and pulling something out of that. And that's a, a very good point. And then telling us that knowledge is sought for other than religion. We spoke about that in one of our other programs on the subject of developing the Muslim character. That what happens is... 
that sometimes people are trying to get knowledge just so they can do one-upmanship. My knowledge is better than your knowledge, but who has all knowledge? Allah Azim. Allah is the, having all the knowledge. He is Alim. And he tells us in the Quran, يَلَمُوا مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِهِمْ وَمَا خَفْهُمْ وَاللَّهِ يُعِتُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنْ إِلْمِهِ إِلَى بِمْشَوْمْ So you're not having any knowledge except what Allah gives you to start with. And how could I go into competition with somebody else of knowledge just to show them how much knowledge I have? And again, in another of our programs, we discuss more in detail, but I mentioned just this part of the hadith of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he spoke about a person who would be brought on the day of judgment and asked, what did you do with the favors of Allah in this life? And he will say, oh Allah, I learned your book and taught it. In other words, he's saying he's an alim and he had this knowledge and he was a great teacher. And then we told him, no, you did it just so the people would say that you were a great teacher or a great knowledgeable person, an alim. And you've gotten your reward. They said it. And then he would be dragged on his face into the hellfire. So from this we're understanding about keeping what we do, having a pure intention for Allah. To do what we do for the sake of Allah. I want to wind this particular one up by saying that it's only Allah who's the one going to guide us. And we need this guidance. We need Allah to open our hearts and our minds to these messages so that we can pull from this and we can make ourselves better Muslims and define our character so that these people, Muslim and non-Muslim, leaders and the common people alike, will realize this is the true Islam. And it's not going to come by just talking. It comes by our good actions and our good qualities. So let's make dua Allah give us this guidance to have this kind of understanding and these good qualities. Amin. And you've been watching The Way of the Muslim, Defining the Muslim Character. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. You're watching Way of the Muslim, Defining the Muslim Character. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes. And during the upcoming episodes, we want to talk in detail about the teachings of Islam, particularly with regard to the character of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, and what's called hadith, or his sayings and teachings. While we're doing this, we're going to be covering a myriad of various different aspects of the human personality, bringing out the qualities, the various facets that will help us to be a better person here in this life and of course to gain a better position in the next life. Let's begin by mentioning a few of the topics and some of the hadith and then in other programs we'll go into more detail on all of these, insha'Allah. First of all, we'll begin by mentioning in the Quran the status of Muhammad wasallam, and what Allah tells us about him and how he is our role model. Let's listen. Allah says, Surely there is for you the best example in the Messenger of Allah. This is talking about Muhammad Islam. For whoever seeks the pleasure of Allah in the last day and remembers Allah often. So if I want to be of those who want to please Allah and I would like to be with those people who are going to be in that paradise, what do I need to do? I need to follow this verse that he is my role model. This is my example. Uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, I have been sent only for the purpose of perfecting good morals. Now here's another saying of Muhammad wasallam. He said, there is nothing which is heavier on the balance than good character. All of this is bringing us to the point that we know that he's the example and we must work on our character to develop ourselves. And how important is that today? If we look to the condition of the Muslims everywhere, we realize that there really are a lot of problems. A lot of them could be solved simply by looking in ourselves and seeing what we're doing or not doing and realize what Islam is teaching us and then make these corrections and adjustments. It can be done on all levels by all people. I myself, an elder person in the, <laughs> in the Uma, in the for the Muslims, uh, I have my things that I need to work on. 
our youngsters, our youth, they have things they need to work on. But all of us need to come together on this one aspect, which is that we have to follow the way, the teaching of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, developing our good character and our morals. We want to keep in mind something, though, that's very important, is that, that we do this for the sake of Allah, not for the purpose of showing off. As you will see in some of the programs coming up, we're going to talk in detail about what happens to the people who show off. But just for now, I want to mention that this in Arabic is called riya, or showing off for the purpose of other than what it's apparent. It's called uh, eye service or hypocrisy and dissimulation. From the point of view of Islamic jurisprudence or the Sharia, it means to perform those deeds or acts that are normally pleasing to Allah, but the intention is to please other than Allah. So these righteous deeds are done for worldly gain. They have been transformed into evil deeds, and they're not going to be acceptable to Allah. Because this riyah is one of the most powerful of such factors, and its subtleness makes it among the most dangerous and difficult to diagnose means that when we do things for other than Allah, but they, we know Allah likes them, what will happen? These things are not going to be acceptable to Allah because that's not the intent behind it. If a person prays, we know this is something Allah loves for you to pray. But if they're doing it so that people see you pray and say, Oh, mashallah, look at this man, he's praying. And that's the reason you did it. And Allah hates it more than if a person didn't pray because he's not doing it for Allah. He's just showing off and doing this riyadh. It's Omar radiallahu anhu who gives us this insight by quoting from the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. And then this particular quotation, you're going to hear something amazing because it's so beautiful, it solves more than just this idea of showing off. It even helps us to understand something called predestination or the qadr of Allah. Omar al-Khattab, Ibn al-Khattab says, and this is the first hadith in Sahih Bukhari, inma amal bin niyat, that every person's actions are going to be graded or rewarded according to the intention. And every person's going to have what they intended for. Now this is recorded in Sahih Bukhari and it's in Muslim and in Abu Dawud. All of these are very trustworthy collections of teachings of Muhammad wasallam with authentic narrations. And from this we learn several points. First of all, that what I'm doing, I do it for Allah, then Allah is going to give me the reward. But if I want to do it for other than Allah, then who is going to give me the reward for it? That's the point. It also gives us another aspect. That is about predestination. Some people will ask you, in Islam, you guys believe in predestination, that Allah has already written what's going to happen. And you say, yeah, that's true. That's what we believe. They say, well, how is this, then, if everything's already written, then how would I be held accountable or responsible for my deeds, but Allah is the one who has already ordained, so to speak, what I'm going to do? How does that become fair? Why should I get punished or rewarded for that matter for these actions when it's really Allah who is causing it to happen? This explains the whole thing. You're not being judged on the outcome. You're going to be judged on what your intention was. So if good happens, but you didn't really intend it to be good, it just happened, then how should you be rewarded for it? Likewise, if there is a bad result, but you didn't intend that, that wasn't your purpose, then why should you be punished for it? Naturally, we realize that in human law, there are going to be things that you'll be punished for. Even if you said it's not my fault, but that's human law. But when we talk about Allah's law, what He has ordained, He's not going to punish you for something that you didn't intend to do. And this really helps us to understand. There's more about that coming up to, in our successive programs too, but I don't want to spoil all the surprises. I just want to give you a little taste of what's coming up. It's also narrated on the, sword, uh, on the authority of Abu Sayyid al-Khudri. He says that the Prophet Sallallahu peace be upon him, said in a khutbah, this was in the khutbah al-wada, which means the farewell sermon. 
He said that Allah will bless whoever hears these words and whoever understands them. For it may be that those who pass on this knowledge are not those who will understand it the best. There are three things concerning which the heart of the believer should feel no enmity or malice. Devoting one's actions to Allah, giving counsel to the imams of the Muslims, and being loyal to the majority. Specifically here, this is telling you that Allah is going to bless those who listen to the words of the Prophet So we have high regard for those companions of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, who understood this and then they endeavored to pass that knowledge on to others. Exactly what we have here is from those people who heard and understood it and passed it on. But he also is showing and expressing the hope that some of the people in future generations are going to understand it even more. And certainly that has happened over the 1400 years since the passing of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Many scholars have come along with more understanding, developing more facets of the diamond or the gem of Islam. All of this it leads us to understand that it's not a dead religion in that it happened a long time ago and it's just blasé. No. As a matter of fact, today, Islam is more alive, maybe, than even in some of the previous centuries. We find the Muslims everywhere going out and trying to get more knowledge and trying to act on it. In fact, Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world today. And why would it be so, even with a lot of negative propaganda going on, if there wasn't something in it that's worth this effort from people and certainly I'm one of those people who has done that and I can tell you that this is a good teaching that we work on this knowledge to develop our character. It said there are three things concerning which the heart of a believer should have no enmity or malice. That is devoting your actions to a law. Well we talked about that. Giving counsel to imams of the Muslims and being loyal to the majority and we speak Speak about that in some of the upcoming programs. I hope you'll take the time to view these programs because when we come to this subject of obedience to the leaders or the emirs and dealing with the problems that some of the leaders of Muslims have, you'll be amazed how the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, gave us this insight and actually the orders on what to do when these events take place because he clearly predicted the very situation that we would be in today and what would happen and how we can resolve it. So you want to be sure and catch these episodes as they come up. Now here's another one I want to share with you. Uh, this is discussing the subject of the Antichrist. A lot of people don't know that we as Muslims believe in Jesus, peace be upon him, as being the Messiah. And that he, in fact, is going to be coming back in the last days and there's going to be an Antichrist, the false Messiah. And we want to share a little bit about that right now. And it's on the authority of Abu Sayyid, who reports that the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, came upon us while we were discussing the Antichrist. And he said, Should I inform you of that which I fear for you even more than the dangers of the Antichrist. He said it is the hidden shirk. Shirk means associating partners with Allah. As we'll learn in episodes coming up, Allah says in the Quran, He does not forgive shirk, associating partners with Him in worship. But anything less than that, He can forgive it. You'll find this in chapter 4 on Nisa. This is something very important because it means I can be forgiven for a lot of stuff out here, but not that. There's some conditions of being forgiven, repentance and salvation in Islam as well, as we're going to also notice in our upcoming programs. But specifically, he's talking about this hidden shirk. Because he says, I'm going to continue, he says, a person stands to make their salah or pray, and he beautifies his prayer because he sees people watching him. I want to tell you about something. This is a story we have in Islam about this very subject. There are some people watching a boy pray. And while he's praying, he's noticing they're watching. So he begins to really amplify what he's doing. To the extent that the people are saying, Oh, 
Look at this guy. He's really doing this and he's doing so and so. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. When he finishes his prayer, he says, Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullah, Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullah. Then he points to himself and he says, and I'm fasting too. There's a good lesson for us. To realize not only he lost the salah, he loses the fast because who's he doing it for? He's doing it for the people. Shaitan comes to us and gets us to do that from time to time. So we want to avoid that too. And we're going to take a break. We're going to come back and we're going to continue talking on this subject, inshallah, on how to better develop our character in the way of a Muslim. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, we're back. You're watching Way of the Muslim, Defining the Muslim Character. In the first segment of this episode, we spoke on the subject of what's going to be involved in our program and how to develop our character to become better Muslims. We talked about what Allah said in the Quran about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi being a role model for us. We spoke about what he said about he's been sent as an example and there's so much emphasis on the character and the moral uh, situation for the Muslim. We talked about what our programs are going to be dealing with. We spoke about intentions being very important in Islam and not showing off. I want to pick up from where we left it off and then uh, in summing that, then I want to speak about some things that Allah tells us in the Quran. Give us our topic for today before we finish up. So let's get started. Allah the Exalted, this is the Prophet ﷺ telling us that Allah the Exalted will say, to those who dealt in riya, the showing off, rather than doing something for Allah. That when he is taken into account on the uh, day of judgment, people's deeds, go to those whom you used to show off for and see what kind of reward you can get from them. Whoa. Imagine on the day of judgment that here I am and I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, I've got all these problems in front of me now and Here's the biggest problem of all, that I'm being asked by Allah. You remember when you showed off for all these people? Well, go get your reward from them, because they're the ones that you did it for. I have another one here. It's on the authority of Abu Huraira. He says that whoever gains any knowledge that should be learned for the sake of Allah, but the intention or the benefit for it is that he would do it for other than Allah then he will not even smell the fragrance of the paradise on the Day of Judgment. So this is real important too because we hope that this show, this program we're doing right now, will be a source of knowledge too. So, And you're watching the program, so as you're learning, you want to be using this brain of yours to realize to take this information, not to show off for other people, but to benefit and develop your own character, just as... We are trying to do while we're making the programs too. Now let's come to what Allah has said. In the Quran, in Surah an nur chapter 24, verse 31, Allah is talking here on a very specific subject, but then here's a general term within the ayah. It says, And turn you all together in repentance to Allah, O believers, that you will be successful. Amazing. I'm going to repeat it. And turn you all together in repentance to Allah, O believers, that you'll be successful. Now I'm going to repeat it again. And turn you all together in repentance to Allah, O believers, that you'll be successful. Now why did I repeat that? I said it three times, didn't I? Because as we're going to learn in some of the programs coming up, that is something that Prophet Wasallam used to do. When there was an important point, he used to repeat it three times. Now we'll come to the next verse of Allah. It says here, the translation, the meaning, Allah is saying, Surely Allah loves those who turn to Him in repentance and loves those who purify themselves. This is in Surah Baqarah. And if you go by the numbers, like some of us in the West do, it's chapter 2, verse 222. So you got all twos all the way across there. Go look it up. Take some time to read your Quran. And by the way, that's one of the best character development sources that I know of, is to go to the Quran and spend time with every day. Because as you read the Quran and reflect on what Allah is saying, then when you look to these hadith to back it up and interpret so you can understand it better, really will help you so much. And Allah is telling that so clear. I'm going to repeat it again. 
that surely Allah loves those who turn to Him in repentance and He loves those who purify themselves. Surely Allah loves those who turn to Him in repentance and He loves those who purify themselves. Islam is having something amazing in it. It's called Tawbah. Tawbah or repentance is a very critical part of Islam. It's very beautiful because it explains what real salvation is all about. Salvation in Islam doesn't come through some form of magic or some little formula or a pill that you can take. It comes through something very important. It's to do something here, do something here, and do something here. The first is to recognize that I've made mistakes. Then physically acknowledge that. And then start cleaning the heart up. And all of that together is considered repentance or tawbah in Islam. It's so important, by the way, there's chapter 9 of the Quran. It's called Surah Tawbah, repenting or repentance. It's very important. Now the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Allah is more delighted with the repentance of one of his servants more than any of you would be who would suddenly find his camel laden with supplies after losing it in a barren land. I'd like to amplify that one for you for just a minute let you think about this. Imagine a man who's out in the desert. He's got his camel loaded up with all of his supplies and he gets down for some reason and then when he turns he finds his camel ran away. How would he feel? Devastated. Because in the desert without supplies pretty much you're dead, <laughs> dead in the water as they say. Well, without any water. And now here comes the camel back. He's, the, the camel returns back to you. How do you feel? You are elated. This is amazing. You're happy, right? Okay. Listen again. He said, Salam, Allah is more delighted with the repentance of his servant than one of you would be who suddenly finds his camel laden with supplies after he lost it in a barren land. Now it's interesting from a linguistic point of view, the term used here about an animal turning back to you, because the word tauba indicates a turning back, as it were, repenting or turning back to a law. I think that makes it pretty clear what salvation is about in Islam, but just in case you didn't get it all, we got a little bit more on this same topic. He, the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, if you don't commit sins, then Allah would sweep you out of existence and replace you by another people who would commit sins and then ask for Allah's forgiveness and he would forgive them. This is narrated in Sahih Muslim. This is an amazing statement. I want you to think about that. If you didn't commit any sins, first of all, you wouldn't be a human being, would you? You'd be an angel because they don't commit sins. But when you commit sins, you're actually fulfilling something. And this is explaining right here. Allah would sweep you out of existence and then replace you with another people who would commit sins and they would repent to him and then he would forgive them. And this is a part of our understanding of why we're here and why we go through this life before we go on to the next life. Also why there's punishment and why there's reward. Here's another one. He said, O oh people, turn to Allah in repentance and seek his forgiveness, for surely I repent to him more than a hundred times a day. Now imagine if the prophet of Allah is turning to Allah and repenting, asking for Allah's forgiveness. A hundred times a day? That's, uh, I, I want to do more than that, because I'm worse, I know, than any prophet. How could this be? Let's listen to it again. He said, O people, turn to Allah in repentance and seek His forgiveness, for surely I make repentance a hundred times a day. Then he says also regarding repentance. Repentance, we're going to mention this, is such an act of worship that doing it can totally erase our sins altogether. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever repents from sin is like a person without sin. Whoever repents from the sin is like a person without sin. 
Now you might wonder, now wait a minute, wait a minute, this sounds a little too easy. But is it really that easy? If it's so easy, why don't we do it? Why don't we stop sinning, ask for Allah's forgiveness, and repent to Him? Why don't we do that? Because of Riyah, which we mentioned earlier, the showing off. So now we see the tie-in here with this. What happens to us, we start out a lot of times with good intentions. But then along the way, we begin to show off. And in this showing off, we lose the beautiful connection here between our good deeds and Allah. So what happens? They become rejected. And the only way to overcome this is through repentance, regardless of what the sin might be. Some people might say, well, this is only a minor sin. Maybe somebody said, I just smoked a cigarette. Somebody might say, well, golly, I just drank a little bit of alcohol. Or somebody else said, I just told a little small lie. And everybody's looking at everybody else like, you're worse than me. You're worse than me. This guy did that. He did that. I didn't do any of those things. So, so you don't repent, do you? Let us take another lesson from the Quran itself. When we find that when Allah speaks of how he created Adam in the best of molds, the best of form, and this was his best creation, and he ordered all the rest of creation bow down because of my great creation here of Adam. And all creation bowed down except Iblis. The devil himself refused to bow down in front of Allah because he says, I'm better than him. And that's exactly the problem. The Riyah came out of him. This showing off of I'm better. I'm better than him. He's created from this mud or dirt and I'm created from something called smokeless fire. I'm better than him. So he refused to bow down. And by the way, that's still his problem until this day. The devil refuses, refuses to bow down to Allah because of the creation of Adam. Then, what did the devil ask for? He didn't turn in repentance and say, Oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Give me another chance. No. He used his if you will, dua or his supplication to Allah to ask for something else. He said, just let me influence this Adam and all of his offspring coming to them from every possible direction, above, below, and all around them, so that I can get them to show you that they're not worthy of this status that you're giving them and take them all to hell with me. And Allah granted him that, that if somebody would like to follow the shaitan, the devil in this, then if they do that, that's their problem. So we have a choice, you and I, every day. And all the things that we do, we have a choice. And Allah gave us that. And that's the purpose of our life here. That's why we're here on this earth. It's not to get rich. It's not to become famous. The purpose of our life here is to discover who we are and to become better as human beings. Being responsive to this great moral code set forth by the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. This is our duty. This is our obligation to work on our character, to learn how we can define ourselves as better human beings. In our series, this series of the way of the Muslim, we endeavor to do exactly that, to correct ourselves and at the same time hope that everybody can benefit from it. Until next time, this Yusuf Estes making dua for all of us. Allah guide us to the success. Amen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, and welcome to Way of the Muslim, Defining the Muslim Character. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and for the next few minutes we want to talk on the subject of developing the good morals, attributes, and virtues of the Muslim based on the teachings of the Qur'an and the sunnah or way of Muhammad. Peace and blessing be upon him. We're going to be referring to the hadith or his teachings, these narrations which have been preserved for many hundreds of years so that we can take advantage of it in our lives today. We spoke in our previous programs regarding the subject of repentance and salvation in Islam. We talked about what happens when a person has a good intention to start with, but then they develop something called riya or showing off for other folks. And then we talked about how to overcome this problem. And now specifically we want to talk about another area, which is 
the forms of what's called prayer. And the first is something that, by the way, the English doesn't have accommodate, accommodation for this. So we have to go to the Arabic language to pull this out. So bear with me while we do that. The first is the type of prayer which a person should be in all the time. This is mentioned in previous revelations. And that is called dhikr of Allah, the adhkar. And this is something where we are constantly thinking about Allah. He's watching me. He knows what I'm doing. I have to be afraid in front of Allah from my actions. Because if I do sins, I know He's watching me. And I better be careful. But then there's another type of prayer. And this type of prayer is where we stand and bow and prostrate. This type of prayer, this worship is called Salah. And then the third type, this is where you raise your hands and you ask Allah, Oh Allah, I need this, I need that, please don't let such and such happen, or I need such and such to occur, and so on. This is Dua or supplication. All of these can be translated to English with only one word, prayer, but then you wouldn't know what we were talking about. So now we're going to talk about, in some detail, the subject of the dhikr, or being God-conscious, remembering Allah in the things that we do. The dhikr is a great part of our life, and it's an excellent method for us to have a purification of the heart, because it erases all the diseases from the heart, and it produces a love for the sake of Allah and creates the consciousness of His greatness. It brings us divine peace and satisfaction. And Allah the Almighty Himself asks us to remember Him as much as possible. Now what we're talking about here is in the Quran. The Quran is called Dhikr, by the way. That's one of the names for the Quran. The remembrance of Allah. So when you're reading the Quran, of course, in the Arabic language, then you're actually doing this God consciousness, having this dhikr for Allah. Let's read from Surah Al Hasab, chapter 33, verse 41. If you go by the numbers, like I do. It says, O you who believe, remember Allah often and glorify Him morning and evening. And the word used here is from adhkar, or dhikr, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then another verse in the Quran, Allah says, Then when the Juma Salah is finished, you can disperse throughout the land, seek the bounty of Allah, and remember Allah much that you will be successful. This is in Surah al Juma, that's chapter 62, verse 10. It's talking here about what to do after the Friday sermon. The Friday sermon is called the Khutbah Juma, and when it's over with, then you're free to go out in the lands and seek the bounties of Allah. So there's not something in Islam where we have one whole day where we're not able to work or do any business. No, there's just a couple hours here to take out of this particular day and dedicate it to going to the masjid or the mosque and pray there, listen to what the imam or the preacher has to say for us. Then, after that, Go out seeking Allah's bounties, but keeping the remembrance of Allah in our hearts and minds while we're out doing so. And by the way, I found that very useful for myself. <laughs> I like to do that. I like to listen to something about the way of Islam, or read the Quran, and then when I go out into the daily life, keep in mind that Allah is watching and paying attention to how my character is. That's Again, why I want to remind myself and all of us that the purpose behind this program is to develop this good Muslim character. Also in the Quran, this is something else Allah says. Those who believe in the oneness of Allah, this is talking about the Tawheed in Islam, the monotheism, those who believe in Allah and whose hearts find rest in the remembrance of Allah, verily in the remembrance of Allah do the hearts find this rest. This is in Surah Ra'id. Chapter 13, verse 28. And in a verse, the men of faith have specifically been warned not to forget to do this adhkar or dhikr for Allah. To be absorbed in this, even when they're out seeking their wealth or taking care of their families. Allah also tells us in the Quran, O you who believe, don't let your riches, your wealth, your children divert you from the remembrance of Allah 
in any act. Thus, the loss is their own. So if anybody acts like that, then they're the losers. I'm going to repeat it because, as we mentioned in some of our previous programs, this is, of course, what Prophet Muhammad used to do. Peace be upon him. Oh, you who believe, don't let your wealth or your children distract you from the remembrance of Allah. Because if any of you do this, then the loss is your own. Think about that for a minute. When I go out in the day and I'm working, or maybe mowing the lawn or trying to make some money, take care of my family, if I get really diverted away from the remembrance of Allah, things can occur and I might do things that are really out of character, not good, bad things, because I wasn't thinking of Allah. Sometimes when we go to the mosque, or sometimes when we're sitting with good people, or reading the Quran, we feel, you know, really good. We have this idea that I want to do good things. I want to go out and improve myself. But then when I go out into the world, what happens is, I get distracted away from this remembrance of Allah, and then I begin to get into these crazy nonsense things that happen. So this is what this is telling you. Even though you left the mosque or left the person or you closed your Quran and walked away from it, but still don't close your mind off. Don't close your heart off. Keep thinking of Allah and think of some of the things that go along with that. In relation to that particular ayah or verse that I read to you from the Quran, Prophet Islam taught us an amazing type of dhikr that's associated with that. He spoke about it and it's in reference to this ayah or verse. And that if a person would say, La ilaha illallahu wahtu la shrika lahu, lahu muku walu hamd, yuhi wa yumitu wa hu ala kulishayin kadir, 100 times, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala God Almighty would record for him 100 good deeds, take away 100 bad deeds, and give him the reward as though he had freed 10 slaves. And that this saying would be a source of protection for him all day long against the shaitan or the devil. Now, the translation of what I said, maybe in some of our upcoming programs, it was just to give you an idea that this is one of the types of dhikr or adhkar that you can make. That you are just doing this for Allah. You're remembering Allah. Now, maybe you're new to Islam and you don't know a lot of Arabic. I can recommend something real easy for you. You can say Allah. You can say the word Allah until you learn more. Then you can say Subhanallah, which is to glorify and magnify Allah and His greatness. You could say Alhamdulillah, which means to give the praise and all the worship to Allah. And you can say Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. And this is also something very good to say. And you can sh surely you can say La ilaha illallah. And this is one of the best sayings there is, according to the teachings of Muhammad. Peace and blessing be upon him. So all of these things are called adhkar or dhikr. And you can pronounce them slowly, step by step, until you're able to do so in an easy manner. And then you can follow the footsteps of Muhammad wasallam when he taught us that after every prayer that we should remember Allah. And you can do so with your hand. You can just touch your finger to your hand like this and say, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. See how it works? You're glorifying Allah, magnifying Allah in your mind and in your heart while you're saying that and count all the way down on your fingers, then duplicating it again on the little finger, coming back, then doing it on the thumb twice. That's 33 times. And then you could say, Alhamdulillah, the same way. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. And then go through the fingers again, step by step. And then twice on the little finger and come back again to the thumb and complete twice here. That will give you 33 of that. And then you say, Allahu Akbar. Again, the same way. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. 33 times. Now, 33 times subhanallah, 33 times alhamdulillah, and 33 times Allahu Akbar is what? 33 plus 33 plus 33. 99 times. So these 99 remembrances of Allah is something so beautiful, so wonderful. 
and that when a person does this after their prayers, then they followed the way of Muhammad, developing a characteristic of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and that is to keep Allah in the remembrance of their mind and in their heart. Also Allah tells us in the Quran, O oh, you who believe, don't let your riches or your children divert you away from the remembrance of Allah. If any acts like this, it's his loss. What would be the loss? What is the loss if he doesn't do it? Well, he's distracted. He's distracted by the material things. Also, a loss that he has, he didn't know this maybe, but each time I did that, I got reward for it. And another thing is that each time you do something like this, it's recorded as a good deed. But how about when you teach somebody to do it, and then they do it. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, taught us, whoever calls to a good deed then he'll have the reward for that when the person does it, and it takes nothing away from the reward of the person doing the good deed. So all of this adds up to a form of remembering a law, thinking about a law, keeping this in our hearts and in our minds, to the extent that, you know, when I go out through the day, I'm doing this or that, I still am conscious, Allah is watching, and it gives me a closeness to a law. And this is one of the characteristics and aspects of Islam that we want to work on in our program called Way of the Muslim, Defining the Muslim Character. We want to take a break and come back to this. Stay tuned for more. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, we're back. You're watching Way of the Muslim, Defining the Muslim Character. We've been talking here on the subject of remembering law. And when a person's remembering a law and thinking about a law and the things that he does, this, as we said in English, is a form of prayer to keep a law in our remembrance all the time. There's another type of prayer when we raise our hands and we ask a law for things. And that's also something we're going to be talking about in our programs coming up. But I want to talk about something now that will destroy our good deeds. And we want to be very careful of that. The thing that will cancel out all these good prayers and wonderful things that I was doing, I could lose it all by something called riba. I want to talk about backbiting or riba in this segment of our program. One day the Prophet, peace be upon him, asked his dear companions whether they knew who the poor people were. And they answered, the poor is the one who has no money. And he said, in my nation, meaning the Muslims, the poor man is the one who appears on the day of judgment in front of Allah. And he had offered his prayers. And he had paid his charity. And he had observed the fasting. But he would have abused people. And he would have falsely accused some people. And he would have taken someone else's property without authorization. And he would have murdered someone. He would have hit somebody. Mm. And all of his virtues would then be given to his victims. If his virtues are finished before his wicked deeds are finished, then the errors and the sins of the victims would be given to him and be thrown into the hell as a result of it. Sometimes when we're in our program here, we will repeat some of the same teachings because they overlap and cover in other areas. In this case, specifically, I want to mention there's a point here that it says that when a person's backbiting, and that's the focus I want to take from here, backbiting is considered a sin so serious that if you engage in it, this is something that Allah will allow the person on the day of judgment to take their rights on you for what you said about them. And all of us have this. I don't think any human being can say they're totally free of slandering people behind their back, saying things behind their back that they don't want said. But Islam has a lot more to say about this subject. In fact, Allah warns us against ghiba or backbiting in the Quran in Surah Al-Hujurat when he tells us, don't backbite. If you're a believer, oh you who believe, don't engage in this backbiting of each other. Don't do that. Because, and look what he compares it to. He says, you would hate eating the flesh of your dead brother. So in the same way, you should hate doing ghiba. 
And we, in English today, call it backbiting. It's an interesting comparison, I would think. Now, regarding this, Ibn Abbas, this is the son of Abbas, radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with him, says, on the day of Nahr, this was the Hajj, or the day of Eid celebration, the Prophet, peace be upon him, addressed the people, and he said, O people, what day is this? And they said, it's the sacred day. And then he was quiet. Then he asked, what month is this? They said, it's the sacred month. And then he was quiet. Then he said, what land is this? And they said, it's the sacred land. And then he was quiet. And then he announced, verily your blood and your wealth and your honor is sacred one to the other. As the sacredness of this day, as the sacredness of this month, and as of the sacredness of this land. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, repeated it over and over. Then he raised his hands and his head to the, it raised his head to the heavens and he said, O oh Allah, have I given the message? O oh Allah, have I given the message? Do we see something here? This is so important in the character of the Muslim that the Prophet, peace be upon him, repeats it over and over and then he turns to Allah and he's asking, O oh Allah, have I delivered the message? So what is the message? The message is to know that each and every one of us has things that are our rights, that are sacred to us and to each other and we have to respect each other's rights. You know, Islam is like this. It has two important ingredients. The first is rights, which we've been speaking about here. That which is sacred, a person's honor, his dignity, his respect, his wealth, and his family. All of these things are on this side of the balance. But on the other side is something called limits. We have to recognize limits. We can't transgress certain limits. We have to stay within due bounds. So Islam is given this balance in our character, in our life, that as we go through the daily life, we balance what we're doing and stay out of other people's rights. Let them have their rights too. Otherwise, as this hadith is teaching us, on the day of judgment, these people are going to be able to get their rights back anyway. Whatever you say and do against a person and backbiting them, they're going to get that back from you. Either they're going to take away from you what? Your good deeds? Or if you have no good deeds left, then as a result, they'll put their bad deeds on you, and you wind up going to hell. And this is really a despicable condition. Not something you or I, either one, would want to fall into. And it can be avoided very easy. Look, see this thing? And we've mentioned in other programs, this lisan, this tongue, is something that if you could guard against it, it can be the difference of paradise or hell for you. Just this one little thing here called the tongue, just to keep it under, under your control. And don't use this against other people. This is a very, very important teaching in Islam about that. Let me elaborate a bit more on this subject. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, said to his companions, Do you know what riba is? They said, Allah and his messenger know best. Allah wa Rasulullah. He said, It is to mention something about your brother in his absence that he hates to have mentioned. And they said, Well, what if we say something about him and it's true? And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, If what you said about him is true, then that's ghiba. You are doing backbiting to him. And if it's not true, then this is something even worse. This is slander. And certainly that becomes a, an area there where not only you did it, but you lied. It wasn't true. This could really double up against you. Something here for us to learn from is, don't talk about people. Unless there's a need to mention something, it's best to be silent about people. Or to say about this person, you know, I love this person for the sake of Allah. He has some nice qualities, something like that. Be careful of a word in English called but. Because so many times we'll do that. Have you noticed that? Maybe you do. I don't know. But sometimes I find myself saying something nice about some person and then I hear myself say, but... And whatever comes after that could be derogatory, could take away from the nice statement that I made. And this happens a lot to us. We find ourselves doing exactly that. We're saying, oh, this is nice, and that's nice, so-and-so, but 
And the but will now, anything after that, cancel everything before it. And especially when we're talking about other people. It's important for us as Muslims to remember this tongue can get us a lot of trouble. So let's use the tongue for what? What we were talking about earlier, about the dhikr, the adhkar of Allah. So to use the tongue to mention Allah, Allahu Akbar, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah. This is good things to use this tongue for. But it's not good to use this tongue to speak about other people in their absence. Or, and in another narration from the Prophet ﷺ, he said it's even if he's present. Because some people say, well, I'll say this in front of his face. Well, what does that mean? That doesn't make it okay to say it, even if it's true. It's something that he would not like have said about him, whether he's present or absent. It's a form of ghibah or backbiting. May Allah save us from that. I hope all of us can take some benefit from this. We look at the severity of the situation and the result of someone who runs after their Muslim brothers and sisters trying to expose faults. Again, it comes back to it's true. They did something bad and it's true. It's a sin. But listen to this. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, O oh, you who believe only with the tongue, yet faith has not entered your heart, don't backbite the Muslims and do not search for their faults for sure, he who follows the private matters of his brother Muslim, then Allah shall follow his private matters. And whoever has his private matters followed by Allah, Allah is going to expose them, even if they were hiding in the belly of their house. This is a very good teaching here for us to think about. By the way, the Prophet ﷺ used to repeat these. I'm going to recap it a bit, and repeat it for you, and let you think about what's being said. O oh, you who have believed, but only with the tongue, yet faith is not in your hearts. What's that referring to? If you look in Surah Al-Hujurat, chapter 49 of the Quran, the one that we were talking about backbiting, you'll also find in there, some people said, we're believers. These were the Bedouins, the desert dwellers. We've entered Islam, so we're the believers now. And Allah warned them and said, don't call yourself believers, because Iman, faith, has not yet entered your hearts. Rather say, we have submitted Islam, a form of the word Islam. This is important for us. So, and it continues, don't backbite the Muslims. Well, actually, I don't want to backbite anybody, but specifically, you sure don't want to backbite your brother Muslims. And don't search for their faults. For sure, he who follows the private matters of his brother Muslim, then Allah is going to follow his matters. And whoever is having his matters followed by Allah, know that Allah is going to expose them no matter how you try to hide them, even in the belly of the house, as it says here. Amazing. Truly amazing how Islam is dealing with subjects that today psychiatrists, you're talking about the, the top thinkers, the intellects of the world, will tell you that the very things that Islam is teaching in character development are things they're only discovering today in the West. Isn't that amazing? To know that these are the very things. Lying, is this is an example. Because when you lie, you have to tell a lie to yourself before you can tell a lie to somebody else. The lie you tell yourself, you say it's okay to lie. And it's not. Psychiatrists have taught us this. This is damaging to the psyche of the individual. So, I want to think about that for a minute. How about this subject of backbiting? Is this damaging for me? Ask a psychiatrist and they'll tell you. It's not good to follow the matters of other people to look up on what they're doing all the time and be concerned about that. Because in doing this, I'm hurting myself. I want to mention something else. A lot of the television shows we watch today deal with that subject. And it shows people going around doing exactly that. Saying lies, backbiting, and slandering other people. Regardless of how you see it in a TV show, doesn't make it acceptable. No matter how many times a day you see something like this, doesn't mean it's something you want in your character. This type of program that you're watching now is to offset that. That's why we're doing this, so that we hope for ourselves and for you that we can better ourselves and develop the good way of the Muslim and define the Muslim character through these efforts. We hope, inshallah, God willing, you'll be with us for more of this. Until next time, this is Yusuf Estes saying, Salaam Alaikum. Peace 
be with you. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. You're watching Way of the Muslim, defining the Muslim character. And I'm your host, Yusuf Estes. For the next few minutes, we want to be talking about a very important subject in the development of character. It's the role that we have in the relationship with the children. We're taking our information from the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, and then interpreting and translating his words from the Arabic to the English. This is called Hadith, and we'll begin with the first one today, talking about dealing with children. This is narrated on the authority of Aisha, radiallahu anha. May Allah be pleased with her. She says that a lady, along with her two daughters, came to me and asked me for some charity. But she found nothing with me except one date. I gave her the date, and she divided it between her two daughters. And then she got up and went away. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, came in, and I informed him about this story, he said, whoever is in charge, meaning to be put to the test by these daughters, and then treats them generously, then they will act as a shield for him from the hell fire. In explanation of this particular hadith, there's a couple of points I'd like to make. At the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him, before Islam came, <coughs> there was amongst the people a very bad habit, and that was to bury their daughters alive. When they would have a child born that was a girl, they would bury them alive. So when Islam came, it forbid this horrible practice. So this is an example here of showing the mercy that comes with Islam and talking about the relationship of the parents with their children, especially if they're daughters. I want to repeat it for you again because this is the way of Muhammad, peace be upon him, he used to repeat important statements and let you hear it. Reminding you that a lady is coming to the wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and asking for some kind of charity or help. She said, the only thing I had was a date. So when I gave it to the lady, the lady split it in two and gave half to one of the daughters, half to the other daughter, but then she had nothing for herself and went away. So when the Prophet, peace be upon him, came and was informed of what happened, then he makes this statement that whoever is in charge of such daughters like this and treats them generously, then this, meaning the act that they have done, will be so that it's a shield for them from the hellfire. The Prophet, now this we're going to talk about another hadith here, and it says, The Prophet came toward us while carrying Umama, the daughter of Abi As, over his shoulder. He prayed, and when he wanted to bow, he, he put her down, and then he stood up and he lifted her up. This is giving us another demonstration of the humbleness, the rahmah toward the children. I personally experienced this myself when I first came into Islam. I had two daughters. This is why this touches me so deeply to talk about this. Because I had these two little girls with me. And I would take them to the masjid with me. And when it came time to pray... I didn't want them to stray away or bother anybody, so I would have one who would be standing right by my leg, and the other one I would be holding her in my arms. And I had heard about such a hadith as this, and that the Prophet ﷺ used to very much approve of this kind of action, that you have your children close to you, especially in your acts of worship. And then when I would bow, I would hold the one like this while I would bow in the prayer and then stand back up with her. And then when it's time to prostrate, just put her right there. And when I would put my face down close to the ground, she would like kiss my face. And it was really sweet. And now today, these are grown ladies, married, and uh, inshallah, going to soon have children of their own. And I'm looking at them now and remembering these events and thinking how much effect it must have had on them because they have always kept up their prayers through their whole entire life. I've always been worshiping Allah by fasting and doing the acts of charity. And when we're talking about the charity, I recall one time during Eid that one of my daughters was given some money, you know, by the, as a gift from some of the other Muslims. And she took this money immediately without even counting it or looking at it. She smiled and walked straight over to the collection box for the sadaka and put the money into there as if to say that, you know what, this is great. I have something now that I can give 
like other people give. So it shows that by starting your children out young in acts of worship and having them to be involved in worship along with you, this is, it pays off. It pays off here in this life because you see your children grow up as good Muslims, good responsible citizens. But then on the day of judgment, this is also going to be a shield for you from the hell fire. And that's what the Prophet Islam is indicating here. Now, I'd like to share another one with you. He says that, uh, this is Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu. He's talking about the Prophet Islam. He said that Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, kissed al Hassan ibn Ali. And this uh, Hassan ibn Ali is the son of Ali and the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he's talking about his grandson. And this happens, well, another companion was sitting beside him. And the one said, I have ten children, and I have never kissed any of them. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cast a look over at him, and he said, whoever is not merciful to others will not be treated mercifully. And he's talking about Allah. So it's real important for us to have mercy toward the children. Now here it's talking about kissing them. The prophet, peace be upon him, is kissing his grandson. And somebody else is observing that and says, you know what, I have ten kids and I've never kissed any of them. He's saying, now if you're not kissing them, this is not being merciful to them. And who's not merciful to them, in fact, is not going to be shown mercy on the Day of Judgment. It's interesting in the West I found especially in the in the last years, that a lot of people are refraining from kissing their children. As a matter of fact, it seems strange to see a child uh, be kissed by the parents. They'll, and even the children will say, no, I, don't kiss me, you know, I'm in front of my friends. Uh, that looks kind of, you know, what, like I'm a baby or something. Come on, Mom, don't kiss me. Come on, Dad, you know. And in fact, in some cases, when parents are seen kissing their children, people have a tendency to look at this as being something weird. Why are you kissing your children? I know that when I visit Muslim countries and talk about this, they say that even though my father is elderly and I have children of my own, my father still kisses me. And I recall a situation that occurred in my own life that... When my father entered into Islam, when he got old, very, very old, and couldn't take care of himself anymore, he lived with us. And, well, he was sitting in his chair, and I was working at the computer, at this I do all the time on the Internet, you know. And I heard some racket going on in the kitchen. And it was my two daughters fighting over which one of them needs to do the dishes next. And one is saying, no, you have to, no, you have to, no. And they started to fight. So I started to go in there and settle the argument. But as I got to the door, I realized, when I go in there, you know what they're going to do? They're going to say, Salam alaikum, daddy. And I'm going to say, what's going on? And they're going to say, nothing, because that's what they always do. So I decided, you know what? And I saw my father sitting there. I let me go to my father and let me... Just give him a big kiss on the head. You know why? Because I know that me and my sisters gave him this same kind of problem all the time we were growing up. And I'm positive that he, he had his share of that. So I went to my father and I kissed him on the forehead. And I said, Dad, I love you. Now this was not a custom that we had in our family before we came to Islam. But I wanted to do that because this is in Islam. I went to my father aged in his mid-80s, you see. And I kissed him on the forehead. I said, Dad, I love you. And I kissed his forehead. I went and sat in my chair, returned back to my work. It got quiet out in the kitchen anyway. After a while, one of my daughters, she came out, went straight to me in my chair. She kissed me on my forehead and she said, Dad, I love you. This really touched me, you know. And I was sitting there thinking, my gosh, what's this? This is what I just did with my dad. And a little bit later, after the other one finished doing the dishes, she came out and walked up to me, kissed me in the exact same place, and said, Dad, I love you. I started crying. Neither one of them had known that I'd kissed my father like this. But Allah is showing us this is a very good lesson for us, that this rahma, this mercy that we show to our children, is something that's passed on. As I kissed my father, so my children also kissed me the same way. 
And you know the Prophet ﷺ taught us that how you treat your children is how your children are going to treat you. So those of you who are young and you're thinking in terms of, you know, when I've got children, what am I going to do with them? And how will I behave with them? Then think about how you treat your parents. Because how you treat your parents is how your children will treat you. This is a very good example that we have in Islam. Then uh, we have another one here it's on the same subject of the children and kissing them. There was a desert dweller called a Bedouin. And he came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and he said, You people, you kiss your boys, but we don't kiss them. And the Prophet said, I cannot put mercy in your heart after Allah has taken it away from you. So once again, we see this example, and it's an excellent example, that the mercy in the heart is being used as, as a comparison to kissing our children. I realize that for some people that don't have this habit, they might find it strange, and they find it a little bit weird, but the children need this. They need to feel this physical contact to be hugged, then to be kissed. And this is something that Islam is not just encouraging, it's insisting on this good relationship between the parents and the children. Some of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ were brought before the Prophet and a woman up from them was milking her own breast to feed the little children who were uh, without uh, mothers. And there were some of the children, they were captives that they had, that um, didn't have any milk to drink. This woman would take her own milk and give it to these children. Uh, she had lost her child but later found it, and so she was able to do this. And the Prophet said to us, Do you think that this lady can throw her son in the fire? And we said, No. If she has the power not to throw it in the fire. The Prophet said, Allah is more merciful to his servants than this lady is to her son. Now in this example, what we have is a woman who's lost her child. And when some captives have been brought in, and they're uh, without parents, little like orphan children, they're needing milk, and this lady's giving milk from her own breast to these children. And so the Prophet ﷺ is explaining something here. In the example, he said, Would such a woman is so merciful even to other people's children, would she ever throw her child in the fire? And he's saying, Not if she has the power to avoid, she wouldn't. And so Allah is saying, And Allah, He's even more merciful than this. And so this shows us some of the characteristics that we can develop in building the character of the Muslim. You're watching way of the Muslim. We want to take a break and come back to this subject of dealing with the youth. Stand by. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, we're back. You're watching way of the Muslim, defining the Muslim character. We've been talking on the subject of how we deal with children and how children deal with the parents. We've been comparing this kissing and hugging as a form of mercy, even to the extent that whoever doesn't do this is not being merciful with the children. As such, the one who doesn't show mercy won't be shown mercy by Almighty Allah. So, we want to continue in that same vein. I'd like to mention to you a couple more on this subject before we move on. And that is that the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, was uh, confronted by Abdullah, and he said, I said, O Messenger of Allah, which is the, the greatest of sins? He said, it's to set up a partner with Allah and worship, although he alone created you. I said, okay, then what's next? He said, it's to kill your son, fearing that he'll share the food with you. And I further asked, what next? He said, it's to commit illegal sexual intercourse with the neighbor, the wife of your neighbor, and then Allah revealed as a proof of the statement of the Prophet, and this is in Surah Al-Furqan, chapter 25, verse 68, those who invoke not with Allah any other God, and I would like to encourage you to read that from your Quran, by the way. If you don't have a Quran, you need to get a copy of that in the language that's easiest for you to read from. Read these verses for yourself and enjoy the meaning of it. But in any case, this 
is a great lesson for us. It, it says here that Abdullah is asking Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, about the greatest sin. The, all the previous monotheistic religions have in their revelations this statement of not worshipping any god alongside of God. There is no other god beside God. And that's exactly the greatest sin here as well. And he said after that, he said, well, that being the greatest sin, the next is if you kill your son fearing to, that he'll eat your food. Again, this was a practice, you see, in those days that people used to kill their children. Because they feared, well, if we have too many children, then there won't be enough food. But this implies that a person doesn't really understand that the food is not something you have to be concerned about. Your children are not going to eat something that was for you to eat. For Muslims, we know that every single bite of food that's written for you to have, you're going to have it. And whatever was written for them to have, they're going to have it too. So it is wrong for us to take the life of a child and suspecting that they're going to interfere with our own well-being or our risk, as they call it in Arabic, daily bread. He says, I said, what's next after that? He was talking about having illegal sexual intercourse with the neighbor's wife. And then Allah revealed the verses that are pertinent to this topic. It's interesting to me, having been a Christian, to come into Islam and realize that these are the same beautiful teachings from the previous revelations. This is not something new. This is the same exact concept of what's the priority number one is to have the right belief. And this is the same thing that we find in the Holy Scriptures from before. So it's not a new message, is it? We look in the Old Testament, the Torah, and we find that after the correct belief and the worship of one God, that the very next most important thing is the relationship to the parents. Then we look to the New Testament and we find the same thing, that the greatest commandment is to worship one God and then our relationship with the people. And then when we come to the last and final testament, which is the Quran, again we find that the most important thing is la ilaha illallah, the worship of only one God and no partners with him. And then the relationship of the people with the emphasis on the parents and the children. This particular one that's coming up here is very interesting. Osama bin Zayed says that the Prophet Wasallam used to put me on one of his thighs and he would put Al-Hassan ibn Ali. This is Hassan ibn Ali is the son of Ali, the grandson of the Prophet upon him, on the other thigh, and then he would embrace us, and he would say, O Allah, please be merciful to them, as I am merciful to them. So this embracing of children is a form of mercy in Islam, to teach them love and compassion, intimacy and closeness that only comes between parents and their children, or grandparents and their children the elders of the community who, when they show this kind of affection for children from the heart and the children feel this, it helps them to build their character in a way that they're very merciful with other people. I've found in traveling around the world to different places that when I observe that a community has people who are really taking care of the children in this way and being merciful with them, kind to them, understanding with them, and being patient with them, that these children have a tendency to grow up and be very healthy and balanced in their emotion and their character. So this is a form of building the character of the child is for the parents and the grandparents and other relatives to do what? And that is to show this compassion to them and be merciful with them in this beautiful way. And I know that sometimes, as I said, in other civilizations, other societies, you find people who will uh, shun this idea. They'll say, no, 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 you know, I don't, you don't need to touch me. I don't need to touch you. It's not a touchy-feely thing for me. But actually, this is probably what those people need more than anything. Probably when they were children, they didn't find something like this. And maybe that's why they're resisting it now. But in any case, the thing we're showing here is that Islam is teaching you a great 
way to build character amongst our children, amongst our youth from the very early stages. Another point about this is that when these children are amongst people who are not Muslim or don't follow Islam, then they can observe the difference real fast between what they grew up with and what they're observing here. Now, a lot of times when I meet people in the States, they come over from various countries and they're shocked when they find that the treatment between the parents and children is so detached. And they say, how can people live like this? How do you people get by? I mean, we heard so many wonderful things about living in the West, but we come over and we find such a detachment in the relationship between the parents and the children. It just seems so unnatural. How do you guys do this? And, you know, it makes you think about it. It's true if you see that a lot of times children are just can't wait. I want to get so old. I want to grow up. I can't wait to grow up because when I get so old, I'm moving out. I'm getting my own place and I'm out of here. And this is definitely something that uh, I, I think if you think about this in detail, you realize that th there's a reason. They're, they don't want to be with the parents. Why? Because parents haven't showed them any of this mercy. They haven't embraced these children. They haven't shown them how to develop this part of their character. Then what happens when they get older? And this goes back to the story of the relationship between you and your parents will be between you and your children. Because as they get older, then what will they do with you? Your children, what are they going to do with you? Because a lot of times in the West we find that the children say, okay, that's enough, you know, you're old, we need to put you in an old folks home. And they don't care for them. But in Islam, this is not, it's not conceivable that you would do such a thing with your parents. These are the people that raised you up. These are the people that helped you when you were helpless. And now when they reach a state of needing help, it's apparent that they, you're the most logical one as a child to help your parents. How could you just put them out into an old folks home and leave them? Maybe you go by on every other Sunday, you take them out to the, buffet or to the cafeteria and you say, okay guys, this is what you're going to get. And then take them back and drop them off and leave them. How can we do such a thing as this? Again, it goes back to not following the scripture, the revelation, because it's come to the same uh, people, the, the same way to the people over and over, in that first is the worship of God alone and then the relationship with the parents and the children. So, we've been focusing a lot in this segment, dealing with this subject of the relationship here between God and His creation, which is us. And we have to worship Him alone without partners. And then immediately after that is this mercy that we have for these children. We have another hadith that I'd like to mention to you in winding this up. And that is when the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever raises up four daughters. And again, this was the encouragement not to be killing these, these newborn baby girls, you know. But he said, if a person has four daughters and raises them up good in the worship of one God, of Allah, then this person on the Day of Judgment will be able to jump over the, the Surat or the bridge between them and the Paradise. Now that's a great incentive, isn't it? To realize that if you raise up four daughters in the good way, then you would be able to just jump over this bridge on the day of judgment and go to paradise. For me, this is, this is a great incentive. But some of the companions of Muhammad, they said, well, what about three? Because some of them had three daughters. He said, and three. And then somebody asked, well, what about two? And he said, and two. And then when I shared this hadith or teaching with some of my friends back in the States, you know what? They said, what about one? I said, well, I had two. I didn't bother to memorize the rest of it. I had two. What happened in our home when we came into Islam and we saw this beautiful teaching it was at a time when my children were really, really young. And they got this benefit from this teaching of being merciful to the children, of hugging them, kissing them, being close to them. And I believe really that this helped develop their character to bring them as they are today. And you know something? It doesn't matter 
even today, now, if I would call a home and say, uh, Salam Alaikum, they say, Wa Alaikum Salam, how's my little girl? And they're always going to say, how's my daddy? Even though these are grown ladies now, and they're saying this, how is my daddy? And I'll ask them, who is the best daddy in the whole world? You know what they say? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then after that, you. <laughs> We, we gained a lot in this episode dealing with the relationship between the parents and the children. And I believe, inshallah, God willing, that if we'll take this and analyze, we'll realize that it's a simple thing to do. It takes a little bit of time, consideration and patience, but it pays off in the long run because the whole goal here of this life is to go to a better place in the next life. And this is one of the steps to build that character to achieve that. And you're watching The Way of the Muslim, developing the Muslim character. And we encourage you to stay tuned for more programs like this. And until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.